Just when the war in Lebanon reaches a ceasefire agreement, the Syrian civil war kicks right back up. In the 12 of you that watched my video on Turkey's interest in Syria, you might remember that I previously stated that the war in Syria didn't exactly end, it just kind of paused. The Syrian civil war was brutal and absolutely sapped both the Assad government and the various rebel factions of a lot of combat power. Following that, the war against ISIS really established that but all the different sides needed a breather. Media attention quickly left Syria following COVID as well as the war in Ukraine and the war in Gaza and Lebanon and people really forgot that the civil war in Syria never really ended. Then when it looked like peace was finally resuming in the neighborhood, HTS finally said, Looks like meat. Back on the menu, boys! <laughs> And within 72 hours, the second largest city in the country, Aleppo, fell into the hands of a rebel faction. Now let's hit on what exactly has happened so far, why the capture of Aleppo is such a huge deal, and what could be next. We also are going to talk about why any of this actually matters to you. After all, this is just another conflict in the Middle East, so why should anybody care after all? Now first, let's do a quick rundown, and this is going to be very rough. We're not going to capture all the different sides here. But a quick level set on who is who in the zoo here. Buckle up because this is going to be more complicated than Game of Thrones. First and foremost, you have the Assad regime in the SAA or the Syrian Arab Army. His key allies are Iran, Russia, and Hezbollah. All three came to his aid back in 2015 during the Syrian civil war and of course as well during the fight against ISIS. Iran and Hezbollah need Assad because Syria is a very crucial corridor which allows Iran to funnel weapons and personnel to Hezbollah and Lebanon. Russia needs Assad because Russia has their only Mediterranean port in the port of Tartus in western Syria. Losing that port would be a complete strategic disaster for Russia as they wouldn't be able to transfer their ships to the Black Sea because of the Montreux Convention which forbids Russian military ships from crossing into the Black Sea from the Mediterranean or vice versa. Instead Russia would have to transfer the ships all the way up north to the Baltic Sea. Russia also has some air bases in Syria which have also been able to help target ISIS as well as Syrian rivals. Now while Russia has been particularly sapped of significant combat power because of the war in Ukraine, Hezbollah got absolutely beat down in Lebanon by Israel and Iran themselves got a bloody nose by Israel as well as a mean look telling them to pipe down. So none of Assad's allies are really in particularly good shape right now or in a position to come to Assad's aid in a quick hurry. Now let's look at the rebel factions because there's been some changes since the Syrian civil war. And of course this is where things are about to get very complicated. While they are all rebel factions, they definitely do not get along. First you have HTS or Hayat Tahrir al-Sham. This group was part of Al-Qaeda back in the day, however they have since left the studio over creative differences. And by creative differences I don't mean ideology, I mean over tactical differences. They're still into the whole Al-Qaeda doctrine thing, they just believe that the war should be fought in a different way. So a good way to remember HTS is that they're not exactly Al-Qaeda, they're Al-Qaeda. Next you have the SNA or the Syrian National Army. This is a Turkish backed group in the north of Syria that has received significant support from the Turks over the years. Basically they're a proxy for Turkish interests but with a Syrian flavor. After that you have the SDF or the Syrian Democratic Forces. These are largely Kurdish forces in the northeast of the country that control a large swath of Syrian territory. They do not get along at all with the SNA or with the Turks. And they don't really get along with the with HTS, but we're going to talk about that a little bit more here in a little bit. Of course, ISIS still exists and occupies some sporadic parts of the Syrian desert. Really, they're just living out their radical Islamist Mad Max fantasy, and I think that's pretty cool for them. <laughs> Note that while the factions that support Assad, that being Iran, Hezbollah, and Russia, really get along with one another and with Assad, the rebel groups, again, don't get along with each other. They're kind of like a family meeting for Thanksgiving and then somebody says something somewhat controversial. Well, that's kind of the rebel forces in a nutshell. They get along in so much that they want Assad gone, but they don't really like what each other has to say about each other. And when they're not all ganging up on Assad forces, they're beating up on each other. And this was a large factor of why the Syrian civil war in 2015 went the way that it did. Russia was able to come to Assad's aid. They didn't have any other conflicts that were bogging them down. Iran and Hezbollah were also able to lend a significant ground force contingent and they were able to really take down a lot of the rebel forces in some key areas. For example, the city of Aleppo as well as the cities of Homs and Hama sustained significant 
battles that lasted almost a year each, and they left those cities in virtually complete destruction. However, the Assad regime was able to maintain control over those cities. However, today, of course, the situation is just a little bit different. Those are your factions. But now let's talk about what's happened over the past week. HTS, or Al-Qaeda, launched a massive surprise offensive eastward towards the city of Aleppo. This is not like past offensives. OPSEC was done fairly well, the elite vanguard led the assault, and the overall operation appears to have been a well-planned and well-executed operation with a very well-equipped and well-trained force. This operation was quickly piggybacked by SNA attacks down towards Idlib, as well as SDF attacks towards the Aleppo airport and towards Kurdish neighborhoods in Aleppo. The offensive appears to have caught the SAA, mind you that's Assad's forces, by complete surprise. Within 72 hours, the SAA, as well as the Russian contingent that was located nearby to help defend Aleppo, had to redeploy and retreat south. HTS pursued those retreating forces south towards Hama, and after briefly entering the city, it appears that they had been repelled. However, now I'm seeing some footage that the HTS fighters have made it back to Hama. South of Hama is Homs, and should the HTS take Homs, they will have effectively cut off the Russian-occupied port of Tartus from the Assad government in Damascus. Now, one of the interesting things to follow up with the HTS seizure of Aleppo is the statement that they released when referring to the Kurdish group and Kurds in the area. In the statement, Previously, these groups are rivals, and there's been no love lost between them. However, in this statement, HTS declares that Kurds have the full right of any other Syrian citizen and that they are part of the Syrian identity. They also declare that ISIS is not part of the HTS ideology, and this is significant because they're both Sunni groups, although with varying flavors, and they condemned what ISIS had done to the SDF and to Kurds in Syria. They then allowed the SDF to retreat from Aleppo with all their weapons and no harm being done to them. And so far, it appears that that has actually happened. It still hasn't been completely clean though. There still appears to be a lot of tension between the two, especially given their history. Now I'm going to quickly remind you that HTS is still Al-Qaeda. And again, it's not Al-Qaeda from the ideological differences, it's Al-Qaeda from the tactical differences. They still very much are Islamic fanatics. Important to remember in this context. Now this is a very dynamic situation that's going on and any map that I've shown you here in this video might very well be outdated even by the time you're watching this video and there may have been other updates that have happened since. So why should any of this matter to you at all? After all, you're probably watching this video on your phone or on your computer and you're nowhere near Syria. Firstly, this offensive towards Aleppo could spring additional offensives from the SDF and the SNA and other rebel groups operating throughout Syria. They might all want to get not only a beating on Assad, but carve out more territory for themselves so that way they can jockey for more influence and power in whatever government replaces Assad. This is all likely to make Assad as well as Iran and Russia much more desperate as well. This is more important to specifically Iran than the war in Gaza or in Lebanon. If Should the Assad regime fall, this would completely cut off Iran's lifeline to Hezbollah and prevent them from projecting power as far west as they've been able to thus far. Also consider that a Sunni coalition government that very much is anti-Iran is not a good thing for Iran. Secondly, this situation might kick up the refugee crisis again. Mind you that in the past, the refugee crisis was exploited by Russia and Belarus. A lot of refugees would go through Turkey into Europe and well, the Turks and the Europeans didn't really like that so they started shutting that down very quickly. However, Syrians were still very desperate to get get to safety and to get through Europe. So the Russians and the Belarusians offered them a scheme where they would transport them all the way up to the Polish border, and that was basically an asymmetric warfare tactic that they employed on a NATO country. And this is still something that they do today. Obviously, things are a little bit different now. Russia's at war, and things are a lot more tense than they used to be. I haven't seen anything to back this up, but my hunch is that Russia may actually attempt to start recruiting some Syrian refugee males that are trying to seek refuge, and in exchange for their military service, they'll grant asylum them to their family members in Russia. Again, I haven't seen anything to support that, but it just kind of makes sense. It would really help both sides there, and it would allow Russia to get additional manpower, and it would give some asylum to some Syrian refugees. But that being said, if they're fleeing war, why would they run right into another one? In either case, you're going to have hundreds of thousands to potentially millions of dislocated persons floating around Syria or beyond trying to find shelter in a war zone. That's not good for anybody. Third, if this war continues and it does manage to take out Assad, well, we're 
we're going to see a fundamental shift in the Middle East. And this is going to be much, much more drastic than the war in Gaza or in Lebanon. Assad's Ba'athist party has been in control of Syria for decades. They've allowed Iran to project power fairly far west from Iran. In an overthrown Syrian government by a Sunni radical organization, as well as a coalition of other rebel groups that don't all like each other, that might be very problematic, not only for Syria, but for the Middle East and even beyond. Not only would these groups probably not be friendly to Iran, they will not be friendly to Russia. But again, consider that the HTS is still Al-Qaeda, and if Al-Qaeda controls a pretty large swath of territory that... Mind you, again, Assad has chemical weapons. Who takes control of those chemical weapons? Yet things begin to spiral out of control very quickly, to the point that Iran and Russia aren't the only ones that are concerned, but potentially the United States and Europe. Also consider that the SDF has a significant presence in Syria, a significant control of territory, and with no Assad to hold them down, they might start turning on the Turks. So while Assad is a terrible dude and definitely deserves what's coming to him, consider that the other people aren't necessarily spring chickens themselves, and this is going to get very complicated and very nasty very fast. There's no real good solution to this conflict. It's also an open question on whether or not it's even in U.S. interest to be involved in this conflict. I mean, it, it is yet another Middle Eastern conflict. I'm pretty sure that most Americans are tired of hearing about Middle East conflicts. And even just judging by my view counts, whenever I talk about Middle East conflicts, it seems you're not that interested either. Frankly, the easiest thing for the United States and for other countries to do here that are not stakeholders in this conflict like Turkey, Russia, or Iran would be to just let this thing play out and not be involved. Or even at worst, to make sure that Assad doesn't lose power so that way chemical weapons don't fall into the hands of Al-Qaeda or ISIS. ISIS is still there. Don't forget that. After all, remember, Assad is very horrible, but consider what the alternatives are. Alternatively, the U.S. might consider that it has a moral obligation to support freedom and democracy, and this might be an opportunity to achieve just that in Syria. It's a complicated balance. On one hand, you have literally Al-Qaeda and ISIS, and on the other side, you have a murderous dictator supported by Russia and Iran. The U.S. has to really take a careful balance in how it proceeds. However, it appears so far that it's supporting the SDF, which isn't necessarily a bad start. And we still don't even know what all of those alternatives are. It's a massive, complicated mess that absolutely nobody likes. But what you should like is this video if you found it informative. Comment your thoughts on what you think the United States or the West should do about this conflict, if anything, and subscribe for more analysis just like this, especially on other conflicts. With all that, I'll see y'all next time. Later.